Thank you very much. So, uh, and thank you very much to, to Ilse for inviting me uh, to address um, you all today. Um, and thank you for coming along. Uh, I can't help feeling I've benefited from the very bad weather that we've had. Um, and you'll also notice from the uh, name of the talk that due to federal cuts, my time has been cut back from 40 minutes to just to 25. Some of you may be quite relieved by that. Um, so my declaration of interest is uh, very short. I uh, have uh, no financial interest in what I'm saying. Uh, as for uh, investments, um, I'm just in the process of setting up a pension for myself. So if any of you got any top tips, I'd be very interested to hear them. So I come from a background uh, in the physical sciences outside your field. I'm not a nutritionist. And uh, I'm very struck by the negative press uh, that the field gets. I'm very interested in That's what drew me into applying the uh, Bayesian techniques I'll be talking about today to this, uh, to this fascinating and very important field. And as a physicist, uh, someone with a physics background, um, I have to accept that what we do to deal with is trivially easy compared to what you guys uh, have to deal with. And the other thing that strikes me is that even amongst nutritionists, within the community itself, there's a lot of concern about the way that the science uh, emerging from the journals uh, just goes all over the place leading to uh, confusion and a lack of confidence in a lot of the results that uh, emerge. And we've ended up with the situation now where we get articles like this that appear not in tabloid newspapers, but actually in the leading journals in the field, which is really quite, uh, quite shocking. So for that specific uh, paper that uh, has a degree of notoriety in your field, I understand, um, for those of you who haven't seen it uh, or are trying to... Uh, make out they haven't seen it. Um, what uh, Unidis and his colleague, Unidis, John Unidis has a, a, a reputation for uh, pointing out uh, inconvenient truths uh, in many areas of science. So what they did is they looked at uh, 50 common ingredients from random recipes drawn from a cookbook. Uh, and then they pulled uh, out using uh, PubMed uh, 264 single studies of the uh, links between those common ingredients and cancer risk, which is, of course, the thing that gets lots of publicity. And what they found was 72% uh, of those single studies found a significant impact on risk, usually upwards, but sometimes downwards, i.e. protective as well. But most of the evidence was weak, which in the terms of um, uh, usual textbook uh, statistics means that the p-values were pretty unimpressive uh, within an order of magnitude of 0.05 or less. And when they looked at meta-analysis, uh, pooling together uh, various studies, well, guess what? We saw a well-known statistical phenomenon called shrinkage uh, where uh, only 36% uh, percent of, of meta-analyses found some impact on risk. And in fact, the median relative risk that was found was statistically non-significant. So it's not just a problem in nutrition. It's also, uh, you know, Unidis has looked at uh, general medicine uh, with a famous study uh, published in January in 2005. Uh, six observational studies uh, making significant claims, 83% failed to replicate. And uh, Stanley uh, and his colleague has already uh, referred to the study in significance, which found similar problems with observational studies. And very recently, it, the American Psychological Associ Association has admitted they too have very serious problems in the field uh, over replication. So what's going wrong here? Well, there are a whole list, and you've heard of many of them uh, explored in some detail already this morning. Uh, of the problems undermining, potentially undermining uh, nutritional fields. Uh, but there's increasing interest that, as well as all these, that there's something else. Hang on, the battery's going in that one. That there may be something else. And quite a few papers are starting to emerge now that you may have read, which are basically saying that maybe there's something wrong with the whole concept 
of significance, which is a fairly scary thought when you think how common the concept of significance is, how widely used and banded around it is. So, the problems with p-values. Now, Stanley uh, has already mentioned some of those in his talk um, about uh, how they can fool people to see significance in stuff that uh, really isn't uh, significant at all. But the, probably the principal problem with p-values is that they don't mean what they seem to. Now, I don't know how many people here if I asked them to come up to the stage and give a definition of a p-value, would feel confident about doing so. And I have to say that you know, this, the textbook definition is rather confusing. It's the probability of getting at least as impressive a result as the one you found, assuming that the real explanation of that effect was pure chance. Okay? That is the definition of a p-value. So you see that the p-value definition assumes that the null hypothesis is true, basically to get the calculation to go through at all. Now, you don't have to have studied to PhD level any science to know that you can't use something where you assume something and then flip it round to make the case against it. And that's what many people do with p-values. They assume that it's the probability that the result was a fluke and that you're onto something. And it doesn't mean that. Now, some of you may be losing the plot, maybe even losing the will to live at this point. So let me, this is one of the cases where a tiny bit of maths actually you know, clarifies things uh, enormously. So does it matter? This is what p-values give, give us, the probability of getting at least as impressive data as we saw on the assumption that there was nothing actually interesting happening. But the thing is, the thing is, I can't get through to the next reveal. There we are. The thing is, is what we really want is the probability that, this, that our result is a fluke in the light of the data that we've got. We're not interested in this convoluted thing. And it's, as you can see there, that really crystallizes the fact that p values give us something that's sort of, in some sense, the wrong way round. It gives us the probability. Uh, of at least impressive data, given, that's what that vertical stroke means, uh, the null hypothesis, whereas we need the other thing. Or better still, we need the probability that it's not just null, that it's not just the null hypothesis, it's actually something, our particular hypothesis is being confirmed, given the data that we've collected. So how can you do that turnaround, that flipping round? Uh, probability experts call it Transposition of conditioning. No, I don't really understand that either. So basically, what you want to do is you want a little formula that can flip that conditioning round. And um, back in the 18th century, an um, amateur mathematician and a reverend um, called Thomas Bayes um, sort of laid the foundations for that technique. It was actually rediscovered and reinvented and put in the modern form by Pierre Laplace, the French mathematician, quite a long time after. Frankly, Bayes' theorem should be called Laplace's theorem, but that's a debate for another day. The upshot for you guys is that he provided what you need. And the good news is the probability of B given A is proportional to the probability of A given B. Yay, that's good. So there's nothing really to worry about. Oh, hang on. What's this? That's the problem with Bayes' theorem. That's, that's the the real shocker, that you cannot just flip them around and just stick some sort of constant in front of them. There's this thing, the probability of B. Where did, who invited that along? But it holds the key, and it's the underpinning for Bayesian methods of data analysis, where what we're trying to do is trying to find out the probability of our hypothesis being true given the data. And what he's telling us is that that is uh, proportional to, in some sense, is actually equal to, the probability of the data given that our hypothesis is true times the probability that our hypothesis is true before we collected the data. Or put in English, Bayes is telling us that the way we have to do scientific research is we start with our prior evidence and then we combine that with the new data we found to get an updated level of belief. And that is the essence 
of Bayesian methods. Now, Bayes is telling us two things there, and he's telling us, firstly, that the great news is we have a technique here for building on what we already know. And it's also telling us that, you know what, you can't ignore this problem of the probability of B on the previous slide, the probability, as far as we're concerned, that our hypothesis is true before we even collected the data. And all the statistics probably that most of you were taught, is based on trying to sweep that problem of prior evidence under the carpet. And the problem there is that is a fundamental violation of the axioms of probability. You can't do what you want and just sweep that mindlessly under the carpet. You've got to address it. That's what Bayes tells us. And all the twisting and turning and all those weird definitions of p-values, that all comes from attempts to ignore the problem of priors, which we will have to address this morning. So Bayes in action. It's probably the most important slide. You can go after this one. Probability of, uh, of uh, um, hypothesis being true uh, in the light of the data is the prior evidence for it. Uh, combined in some way, in a mathematical sense, with the data that we've just collected. So our prior, we can collect, uh, we can, we can, we can uh, pin down uh, by a distribution, which we can specify. It's often a normal distribution for reasons that we'll go into. And what you do is you say, well, I think before uh, we, knew, we started collecting this new data, uh, that... Um, the most likely range in which, say, an odds ratio is a, a particularly good example, lies is between these two bounds, okay? So we crystallize it in that way. And if we're not really not very certain, those bounds can be really quite wide, okay? And in fact, if you plead in complete ignorance, they can be infinitely wide, okay? We have no idea what the result is. And then you capture the data. This is a familiar thing. This is the data uh, captured in a confidence interval, we've got a lower bound and an upper bound. And you can see that's quite, that's quite sharp because the data is telling us something which is you know, really quite, it's much more definitive than our originally rather vague prior. And then Bayes allows us to combine that, there's a formula for all this, to produce what's called the posterior distribution. As you can see, the combination of the prior and the data leads to a slightly higher peak, that's a bit more focused because we've combined our originally fairly vague prior with our new data. And it's also shifted um, the um, distribution for the data in isolation, or alternatively, the data viewed in the light of complete ignorance. And it's moved it slightly to the prior which you would expect. It moves it more if the prior is really strong, less if, the, if your prior beliefs are rather weak and vague, and not at all if they're uh, completely vague. So there are formulas for doing all that all readily available. So the advantages of using this technique have been recognized in many, many areas of, uh, of science, um, especially in ones I'm more familiar with, like cosmology um, and particle physics. Uh, like the Higgs uh, discoveries used a lot of Bayesian methods. And, uh, but it's also coming into medicine as well. And you'll find uh, some account of uh, my approach here to what I'm going to be talking about shortly in that book, there by uh, David Spie Spiegelhalter and colleagues. Now, the good news is you're already using Bayes, even if you don't know it. Confidence intervals are basically what Bayesians called, not confidence intervals, but credible intervals, combined with really vague prior insight, i.e. you have no idea what the result might be. So that's good news. Meta-analysis uses, in its simplest form, uses Bayesian ideas of adding together uh, evidence as it accumulates. So that's familiar. But the thing about Bayes is it's capable of a hell of a lot more and it's capable of a lot of things you're really uh, interested in. As we've seen, it gives much more transparent and clear inferences from data, answers the question you're interested in, not some convoluted uh, question about what you might have seen if the result uh, was the result of fluke. Um, allows transparent uh, uh, combination of knowledge 
and it, all the you know, standard stuff like regression correlation, model fitting, uh, it can identify uh, the parameters in the model that are uh, doing the, uh, most of the heavy lifting. The thing I want to talk about for the rest of, the, of today, though, is something which I call uh, plausibility analysis, okay, which I think uh, you'll find um, of practical use and hopefully uh, will provide uh, some way of attacking some of the issues that we've talked about already this morning. So, what does this mean? Okay, so, we all know the basic problem with, not just in nutrition, but in lots of areas of research, that we see results that are said to be statistically significant, but you know what, they're really not very plausible. So, what do we mean, let's crystallize this concept of plausibility in a way we might be able to capture mathematically. Plausibility means, well, what do we do when we're, we're considering plausibility? We're comparing it to what we already know and saying, you know what, that sounds like nonsense to me, given the wealth of evidence we've got elsewhere. Or, yeah, that's sort of in line with those other studies, isn't it? And you can see that that is something that Bayes is really well suited to attacking. And in Bayesian terms, the way you uh, uh, would attack the uh, uh, concept of plausibility is with data combined with prior belief. When you combine those two, do you get the final distribution, the combination of them, being credible at the 95% level? That's the thing. But then we've got to face the problem, the dirty problem in Bayes, which is the problem of what prior do we use? So we could use expert priors. Well, I co-authored a paper in The Lancet with Ian Chalmers uh, th three or four years ago where we looked at how good experts were at predicting the outcome of uh, randomized controlled trials, and um, the abstract basically says they suck, okay? They are not at all good at it, because they bring their own biases, usually optimistic. Okay, that's so we'll use your priors. Well, you know what, I'd like to use my priors. So we've got an issue here immediately, and this is the thing that Fisher, uh, who developed all the statistic, uh, statistical techniques that uh, are widely uh, taught, even today, the great uh, Ronald Fisher, that's what he was trying to avoid, this subjectivity as he saw it. But there are ways around it, and one of the ways we can do it is by standardizing the prior using someone I'd like to introduce you to today, the fair-minded skeptic. Okay, so let's meet him. Here he is. <laughs> Looks like the man with no name, doesn't he? So... What we've got there is a prior distribution, and as you can see, it's fair-minded in the sense that it's symmetrical about no effect, okay? And it's skeptical in the sense that most of the weight hangs over the no effect, an odds ratio, and I'll be talking about odds ratios uh, for the rest of the uh, time, over no effect, okay? And the strength of that skepticism and the strength of his convictions are basically defined by the width of his poncho there. And if he goes really wide, right, he's really quite skeptical about a lot of stuff. But if it's quite narrow, he doesn't take a lot of convincing by, uh, by data of quite small odds ratios to convince him that he's onto something, that you are onto something. And he's a normal guy, um, so he's unassuming by which I mean, in a mathematical sense, uh, that uh, you only have to assume the existence of a mean and a variance. Uh, you don't have to say, uh, say anything about um, what we call higher moments. And he's easy to work with. Bayes and normal distributions work really nicely together. So, how does this work in practice? So what we're doing is we're, our plausibility analysis concept works with what prior belief would a fair-minded skeptic need to hold to accept a result as plausible at the 95% level. So we start with our data expressed as an upper and lower bound of the odds ratio. Now this instantly distinguishes it from standard statistical methods in that you're focusing not on the central value and whether the lower bound excludes no result. Oh yeah, we got a statistically significant result. Bayes forces you to con concentrate on the width of the interval. And that is telling you not only where the central value lies, but also the power, the evidential weight of your data. But most people ignore 
half of a confidence interval. Dave, just look at the one to see if it's statistically significant. So Bayes forces you to address not only size of effect, but just how compelling the evidence is for it. And then what we do is we use Bayes' theorem to calculate what we call a credible power prior value, which is the prior odds ratio needed for our fair-minded skeptic to accept the result as plausible at the 95% level. And then we ask ourselves, is that CPV, is that really justifiable in the light of what we already know? Okay, and if it is, then we know that that will lead to a posterior distribution that is plausible at the 95% level, and the result will be, could be deemed as that. So, and if you're worrying about how to do the sums, as uh, um, John P uh, Pizzullo has uh, developed one uh, on that page that runs uh, my techniques. So let's do um, some worked examples. But before we do that, some of you have probably been wondering, well, what about if there is no prior evidence at all? What do we do then? It's an out of the blue study, which we see a lot. So, you know, I'm having trouble with the old, there we go. So I think it's not too much to ask that a study should be credible in its own terms. That plausibility should not require of this study that we already believe in the existence of result even more impressive than the result that's been found by this one-off, never-before-seen study. I don't think that's too much to ask. And that means that every study must have a central value uh, that lies outside of its own CPV. So we, we don't already have to be convinced of something even more impressive before we saw this. And what this shows, that, um, if it doesn't, that the study is quantifiably weak. We don't have to just say, well, I don't believe it. It actually quantifies that, even if the result is statistically significant. So this, all this is taking us beyond significance alone. The current approach is very dichotomous in the sense that we have a 95% confidence interval or a p-value, and... It's very easy to decide whether we've got something publishable or not. Uh, and it leaves us pretty cold in terms of how compelling the evidence really is. It doesn't tell us a lot about that. Now, using the Bayesian approach I'm outlining here, suddenly statistically significant results can be subdivided into four categories. So we've got non-statistically significant plus this little lot. Now, at the top of the, uh, the pecking order, We've got confirmatory studies where they're not only statistically significant, but their CPV is also backed. It's also not asking that much of what's already known from previous studies. Credible evidence, just below that, significant. But this, and the CPV sort of makes sense in the light of what we know in that field. Maybe not extant studies, but isn't asking us to believe that if we rhubarb, we stand a 200 times uh, relative risk of getting lymphatic uh, cancer, for example. And then coming down the scale, we have significant, but the CPV really doesn't have any support. We're scratching around for support from pre-existing studies. And finally, the weakest, which is it's significant still, but the CPV lacks support from other studies, and it's not even the central value found by this study. You already have to believe in something more impressive than that to take this as believable. So let's take a, a worked example here. Skaskin and uh, his colleagues did a, 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 a study of serial fiber, claiming it was modestly protecti protective uh, against cancer. That was the uh, confidence interval they got. Plausibility analysis, very easy to do in terms of statistical significance. Yeah, you just look just by inspection. But is it credible? Well, when you put that, that uh, confidence interval through the Bayes machinery, through that uh, online calculator, it says that you can take this result as credible only if protective values uh, greater than 7% are, um, um, sorry, less than 7% are already credible. And that is, uh, uh, um, you could uh, uh, claim that that is the case uh, in the light of what we already know. So that significant result is not only significant, it's also level B plausible. It's credible in the light of what's already known. And the meta-analysis by own, uh, published in uh, 2011, uh, pointed, uh, sort of substantiated that credibility. Let's have a look at another example. This one, first thing you notice, 
when you, when you become attuned to Bayes, is that uh, the statistically significant, the, the power here isn't that impressive, and it's bordering on non-significant anyway. So we do the plausibility analysis, it's just about statistically significant. But now we're being asked that um, protective effects even greater than 25% uh, are uh, plausible from uh, that form of fiber. There's no evidence for that. And worse still, that 75% is considerably lower, i.e. considerably more impressive than what uh, the central value is asking us for. So that would count as uh, a significant result, but level D, it's weak. And in fact, the meta-analysis found no association uh, a few years later. So now I want to wrap up by talking about the latest threat to our health, which some of you may have been following. We all know about sugar being bad for us, but what about sugar-free diets? So I must say, I really don't want this one to be true, but um, let's see how it uh, survives plausibility analysis. So this one made, predictably, an awful lot of coverage. And um, it even made primetime TV. Uh, to general skepticism, I have to say. So um, the, uh, the original reports were off the back of um, a conference report, uh, but Helen Gardner later published it in a refereed journal, uh, and th this was what she found. This is for vascular events uh, generally. And so let's put it through the uh, plausibility analysis. And what we find is, yeah, it's statistically significant. You can tell that just by one glance. That's one heck of an effect, though, 43%. Let's, uh, let's, see, uh, let's see how uh, it gets on. We put it through. And what we find is that because, Bayes is telling us that because this confidence interval is actually quite broad, it might not lock it, but in terms of power, it's quite broad. Uh, in other words, not much power. You'd already have to believe in a, uh, a, that there's a 60% uh, increase in risk for you to take this 40% risk uh, uh, claim uh, seriously. That's, and that's really not the case. Not, so not only that, we can't substantiate it from any previous study because there aren't any. Plus, the central value uh, was inconsistent with the CPV. So this is uh, a significant fi finding which is nonetheless weak uh, uh, and falls into class D um, standard. So the author's caveats, and there were plenty of them, were fully justified, but they're now quantitatively justified uh, so that you, uh, skeptics and believers can have a punch up on the basis of numbers rather than just who's got the best debating skills. Now, since then, and people who came to the LC uh, uh, meeting in Arizona last January will remember I did that. There's been a um, uh, uh, an update, much bigger uh, study, much, much bigger, like a hundred times bigger, um, focusing specifically on stroke. And this found 16% uh, rise, much smaller, uh, a much tighter confidence interval, as you would expect from all those people. Plausibility analysis tells us it's uh, statistically significant. Is it credible? Well, yeah, it is, if we, all, if we are already willing to count as a 10% increase. And, well, that's sort of, as the authors say, um, there's some evidence that there might be something going off, but it isn't very compelling. But at least it's better than the previous study in that the central value uh, of 60% increase does exceed the CPV. And so this is a Class C preliminary uh, uh, standard of evidence, although I have to say, if you split it between uh, uh, females and males, it's class D females and not significant for males. Make of that what you will. I'm not an expert on nutrition, so I don't know if that's important or not. So again, the author's caveats were quantitatively justified. So to summarize, what can Bayesian methods do? They can make the most of what is already known. They're, they make the, uh, the most of all that expensive research that you've carried out. And they, for me, the most important thing is that they move the analysis on from this pass-fail system, which is serving science so badly. And they also compel quantitative debate about plausibility rather than just these sort of vague, waffly statements in discussion pages, which um, come as a, a, a bit of a shock to someone from a, uh, one of the hard physical sciences. 
And they also, I think, will help reduce putting the, the undue stress that's put on weak evidence, boosting the credibility of science. And I think that's really important. And, can, and Bayesian methods can do their bit in ensuring that our most prestigious journals in this field don't turn into rather less prestigious ones. Thanks very much.